All right, welcome back uh, to the program. My guest is with me right now, Dr. Hassan Mahmoud, who is the Director of Monetary Policy Department at the Central Bank of Nigeria. So it's another Wednesday, another CBN Weekly segment. What we do whenever uh, there is an MPC, MPC is, uh, MPC is held six times a year. Uh, yesterday, the November meeting is the last. So after every MPC meeting, the next day, definitely you get the analysis on the show. Dr. Mahmoud, welcome to the program. Very much. And thank you for uh, coming. Let's get started. It's not a uh, pleasant one for the Nigerian economy now. And not just this Nigerian economy we are talking about is about people. Mm. The figures are about people. Should So we should try to humanize it. Yeah. For those of you that are economists mm. and all of that, you talk numbers. And I say, these numbers are human faces. These numbers yeah. are pockets of people. Yeah. So it's not a pleasant one right now. Mm. Inflation is trending higher. Unemployment is high. So we have a stagflation, hmm. we are in a recession, quite a whole lot of things. Bad news, bad news around uh, the economy. But the MPC met for two days, yeah. uh, Monday and Tuesday. Uh, speak to me about why the, the rationale behind those decisions yesterday. Because even on the program yesterday, when I asked my guest if perhaps the MPC has run out of options, hmm. All right, thank you, Nancy. Um, <coughs> I'm happy you were there when the communique was read. Um, like you mentioned in your intro, yes, we are faced with recession, stagflation, unemployment rising, exchange rate, uh, pre demand pressures, still global uncertainties. But we also mentioned that there's this, there's this uh, sign of optimism in terms of, you know, seeing the, the COVID pandemic you know, regressing now in terms of, you know, the vaccine that has been discovered and people can move around in the world. Uh, trade activities will start, employment activities, industrial production, manufacturing will all kick off because substantially what made the COVID pandemic so severe on economic and financial fundamentals was the lockdown, the restrictions, no economic activities. So jobs were lost, people were not earning income, aggregate demand collapse, aggregate supply collapse, and then we're seeing the negative numbers. For the recession and the, the, the indicators we're seeing are the negative numbers. Yes, they are bad, but they were expected. We've all, we've all projected this, MBS has done it, central bank staff has done it, the IMF, the World Bank too. It's not, it's not uh, it doesn't come out like a shock. It was not like the 2007 uh, crisis that came to the world like a shock, you know. Everybody saw this coming. Uh, Q so some countries actually started recording uh, the negative numbers in Q1 because they started their lockdown since January. We started around March. So we saw the number in Q2, which was still better than expected. And then the Q3 number is also you know, lower than what the contraction we saw in, in, in Q2. So we, we, we have hope that you know, the lag effect of the interventions, both fiscal and stimulus packages, already trickling in into the economy and impacting on that. And that's where you get the optimism from the governor, from the minister of fin uh, finance, saying that, yes, Q4 is going to be better than Q2 and Q3. And Central Bank already looking at having a lower margin of a positive growth, at least getting out of the negative territory, and certain that Q1, we are going to be posting a positive uh, growth. But like you, you also said, the, the, the challenges are still there and uh, we are not, uh, you know, just relaxing uh, on ours on t in terms of, you know, look, pushing on on the, on, the, on the things that have been done to be able to let them, you know, let us realize our expected uh, outcome. Now, um, the central bank governor did say mm -hmm. it yesterday, uh, while of course he was reading the communique that there's optim he was optimistic that mm -hmm. the, Ni the Nigerian economy would exit the recession in the first quarter of 2021. Mm -hmm. That optimism was also shared uh, by the fi finance minister just, I think, about two days ago. So she yeah. shared the same thing. Mm -hmm. But why that optimism? Because I'm saying Q1 is just by the Q1 is like in the next two months. Yes. Why are we having that kind of optimism that the recovery we would exit a recession in Q1 of 2021. It's predicated on what? Yeah. Because inflation is still rising. Yeah. Um, residual effects of this recession are still there. People have lost their jobs. Yeah. I agree that 
Some people have also been stimulated in terms of the TCF by uh, 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 COVID-19 TCF and all of that. Yeah. So why the optimism? Why not sometime in 2021? Why first quarter? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it, it's a simple, what we call linear trend analysis. Okay. You look at what has happened. We came from 2.28, I think, into the year, positive. And then the next numbers we are seeing, 1.97, then dipped then to minus 6, six mm. then 3.4. 3 so you see the curve already pulling out of the low of the zero, be, be below zero margin. If you take, if you extrapolate that, and not extrapolating mathematically now, in terms of what are the activities that are driving this, and how sustainable are those activities, then you can project that, okay, this is what will happen if we have seen this. So we're already seeing, it's like doing a backward loop of your forecast now. We're already seeing the outcome of what we have you know, put into the economy, both the fiscal and monetary, and how that is impacting on the economy. There's a lag effect anyway. So when that lag effect kicks in, because the interventions and all the TCF you mentioned, the manufacturing uh, facilities that were all done, all those came in April, May, up to August, that is still going on, and that is already stimulating employment generation, income levels of households and corporates are already picking up, supply side is also picking up already, you saw the PMI numbers are already picking up, showing sign that industrial and manufacturing activities are already picking up. If you look at the drivers of even the GDP number that we are seeing now, in nominal terms, you can even say that we have started growing. You know, because if you shrunk to minus six and then you are now shrinking it's by a, minus It's a three. milder contraction, that's yes, what you milder mean. Con yes, so in nominal terms, you can, in the, in the, in the analysis, we look mm. at what is happening at the end of same mm. period quarter last year to this year, you call it year on year. But if you look at it just on the small margin and uh, on the short uh, end of it, you see that we're already pulling out of that contraction. And the contraction is, is like I said, is, is, it's, it's uh, comforting in the sense that if you look at other economies that are well stable and mature, even before the crisis, highly consolidated economies, had double digit contraction. US, Japan, UK, European countries, even some emerging market economies. You know, and some of those economies are also pulling out already. Of the, so the V-shape, the small U-shape, all predictions are all coming to bear now. So those fundamental, particularly the fiscal and monetary injections, are what are uh, the drivers of that optimism. That, okay, if this has happened, even within the crisis, over this short period of time, then we should expect that to permeate further into the end of the third quarter. Because these numbers, I'm telling you, in the November numbers, they're way better than the last September MPC numbers that, that, we, that we, we, we posted in the, in the, in the report. So that, those developments are what is giving us that uh, uh, optimism that that will happen, including the global environment. We're also seeing, even though there are cases of uh, second wave and even third wave cases coming up now, that sentiment around vaccine being discovered, more measures taken to curtail uh, the, the spread of the disease in most of the highly affected uh, economies, and other measures that, that are taken by those economies to cushion those impacts made global trade has started picking up financial markets, global financial systems are stabilizing, funds are already moving around in the world. So you see, um, even in the US, there are lost millions of jobs. The employment numbers have started picking up. Okay. So we're seeing those uh, global and domestic, uh, you know, positive indicators. And that's now, what's driving so the sentiment. The, the mm -hmm. Driving that, those positive sentiments. Yes. How about take a look at it in the sense that the TCF for household, the governor did announce yesterday that the yes. MPC has urged the CBN yeah. to at least increase the TCF to about 250 billion. 149 billion has been disbursed so far to over yeah. 316,000 beneficiaries for households and businesses and other uh, interventionist measures. Mm. But where I'm going to actually is that even if you look at the quantum of those that have assessed those funds, yes. those that have not assessed are still more than those that have assessed. Yeah. That's one. Yeah. So it's not equals to yeah. as it were, it's still less than in mathematics. Yes. The second aspect also is that this recession mm. is also predicated on the fall in oil price. Yes. Oil price, though, we're seeing a kind of moderation at about 46 US dollars yesterday. Mm -hmm. That was the highest price for the first quarter, uh, since the first quarter, since March. Mm. But oil price is still within that 
banned, mm. which is not healthy yeah. for us because most mm. of our effects come from the sale of oil. What other thing? COVID-19 pandemic. Mm. But at least there seems to be a silver lining because mm. of the COVID vaccines being released by Pfizer, Moderna, and AstraZeneca. Yes. So if you take a look at those two, uh, uh, um, those two um, um, issues that I've pointed out, yes. aren't they enough to still drag us into a recession even in the first quarter because i am interrogating why that first quarter mm. because the monies have not gotten to people right yeah. now and all price is still low yeah. some something magical happens yeah. that all price gets back to hundred dollars yeah. and the cbm will have more money in terms of fx yes okay you can also look at it another way if the price if the facilities have not gotten to enough and we are doing these numbers then if it gets to more then we're going to do better than the numbers we have now. Um, the, 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 the issue with the, the facility is the issue of the demand, the volume of demand. And also that that's also tells you the impact of the COVID-19 or, the, or, the, or the, the drawback that you see in people's livelihood and stuff like that. So wha when they had uh, 50 billion initial uh, throw of that, over over six to seven hundred thousand applied. The applications now are already in millions. You understand? And so to to meet up with that, and that's why they've already the, the, the bank, the TCF has already overshot three times the initial initial value. So that volume is coming in. And that volume is a genuine demand. It's not that the people just come frivolously. Those people have lost their businesses, lost their jobs, and they need to be, be mobilized. The fiscal authority are also doing theirs, but like you also mentioned, the, the, the fiscal space is thinning out significantly. Even the monetary space in terms of monetary policy too is also thinning out, and that's why we're doing all this, uh, what we call unconventional monetary policy tools, these interventions that, that are hitting directly on the, on, on, on the economy. So even with that going on, if this big ban that is going to come in is going to be impacting equitably, you know, diversifying now so that it goes to every part of the country and where the most vulnerables are, then you start seeing better outcomes coming, up, coming out of this in terms of more people benefiting, assessing it. I am aware that the development finance have also relaxed some of the access requirements for this so that people can, uh, you know, get assets very fast and also the turnaround time for getting that has also been reviewed. And so we start seeing, you know, a, a very quick pickup in that, in terms of access to it and the people using it to, you know, improve economic activities in, 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 the, in the domestic uh, economy. So that, that, that alone should be able to give us that hope and that uh, optimism that things will definitely get better. And which also means that whatever we're doing now, we intensify, monitor very well, make sure that it's, it's impactful. It's hitting the right people. It's not uh, just wasted in, in some leakages. So that is also very important. The administrative structure to monitor that is also, you know, rejigged now so that uh, people can have access to these uh, these facilities. Let's talk about the big elephants in the room. I think there are two big elephants in the room: the exchange rate and inflation. But let me take inflation yeah. uh, uh, first. <laughs> inflation 14.23 percent, the mm. highest. I think in 32 months, and it's been rising for the 14th months straight uh, mm. months. How much of inflation targeting is the central bank doing now? And even uh, at least that would dovetail into what the MPC mm. has to talk about, because mm. the, the primary duty, of course, the central bank is price stability. Yeah. You know, so how much of it, what exactly is the central bank doing to tame inflation? Because your, your target actually is a single digit inflation yeah. but mm. in the past two three four years i don't think we've, we've been able to to attain that so high inflation mm. we have vat increase to about 7.5 percent we have pms increase too as a result mm. of the removal of subsidy i don't know if that subsidy has been removed though <laughs> but uh, that, that yeah. would be a question for for the, for the for the for the fiscal side um mm. tariffs too electricity tariffs and mm -hmm. all of that so how is the management of inflation going to look like right now? 14.23% is biting all of us. It is. It is indeed biting everybody. And it's wiping out the welfare effect of the income gains that have actually been realized from this. 
um, it, it's a big concern. Inflation numbers are a big, big concern. But we've also agreed to the fact that these are more driven by supply side structural problems, including the cost of production, given all these inefficiencies, infrastructure, electricity, power, I mean generally power, security issues are driving food prices. Food price, food is, is the largest component of the CPA up till now, even though it's still, it's still shrinking. But you see that transportation, which is coming in from the PMS and other things you are mentioning, also feeds to the cost of, of the food. So Central Bank cannot do much on this side, on the structural, on the this supply side, more than what it's doing now in terms of the interventions to stimulate supply. But it, you also need to stimulate the demand that will pick up the supply. So while we are looking at production and industrial activities taking up, inventories building up in, in that industry and manufacturing sector, you also look at wages, income, earnings on the part of the individuals and corporates and even the government to take up this, this supply side uh, uh, influence. So the, the balancing of that is, is, is very key. But we are also cognizant of the vulnerability factors of these numbers that you, you mentioned, the VAT, the PMS, prices, the electricity, and other issues that Bread are coming up. Bread price has <laughs> gone up, transport fares gone up, air fares, everything, food. Onions is good right yes. now. So, so we, we are, we're, we're cognizant of that. But that should also drive production in those areas. So because prices, you know, they, they said the, uh, demand creates its own supply or supply creates its uh, own but demand. How will you now no. drive? Uh, you know, when the prices uh, are, tra even though this mm. is this are abnormal situation, we're in a crisis situation, the higher the prices, the more people want to supply to make that sales, you know, and then when more people go into that supply, then competition brings in efficiency, comes in. But the question com is, is, how will down. more people go into if they don't even have money to that's start so the that business? That's so that is why interventions are important. You need to stimulate that because the resources to do that is not there. And that is the essence of the credit expansion. Give people these monies, let them go and do production and stuff like that. And that's why also there's no need to be depositing you know, to be encouraging deposit now that are not going to impact on economic activities. So pull out that money from your bank account, invest it in something, agriculture, manufacturing, barbin or something like that. Make some earning, employ one or two people that will even clean your office or clear up the barbin airs and take it to the bin and pay them some money uh, uh, over a month. And then you start to see economic activities uh, picking up. So it, it's a chain of, of events which everybody needs to do its own part to stimulate this uh, effective, you know, aggregate demand and supply. But c can you also look at it this way, that high inflation as well as versus low interest rates is not good? Because not. the interest rate we have now at least for bank about 1%, it yes. doesn't make sense. Yes. Because keeping money in the bank right now doesn't even make sense. Yes. Treasury bills and co. It doesn't. It, mm. it doesn't. So, but how, what kind of signal is it sending to the investment community? Because yes. you're having high inflation, yes. interest rates are low. Now we are having negative real interest mm -hmm. rates, which is discouraging for investment both domestically and even outside the shores of the, of, of the country. But for other fundamentals are also important in terms of what drives investment, not necessarily the yields or the, or the interest rate uh, number. The, the, the safety and the continuity going concern is also very key, that if you're able to break, uh, break even at a particular level, then you can sustain that business, keep those that are working, working, and keep your businesses going. However, the profits, uh, side of it is also a build up on those uh, investment line. So the point is, yes, we're having negative real interest rate now and is, that is discouraging for domestic capital mobilization, which we need to drive the growth you are talking about. But by the time we start bringing the inflation number down, using all these uh, interventions that I've, I've, I've mentioned, and the supply side is picked up through the credit, you know, that people have access to, those that don't have access to those credit, through that credit expansion. Then we start seeing supply building up, the demand side is coming as people are getting uh, employed through that production channel, and then you start seeing the prices coming down. And, but also don't forget, I, don't, I know you are going to go into that, that there are other pass-through channels that hit inflation including the exchange rate yes. which you just mentioned. Th th yes. Thank you. Uh, yes. Well, how did you know what I was going to say right yes. now? <laughs> so you could predict me in terms <laughs> of 
How is the exchange rate weakness also mm. going to is, is driving inflation? Yeah. Because our exchange rate is weak. The official rate of the Naira is 379. Mm. The NAFEX rate is going for, I think, yesterday, 386 or 387. Yeah. And you saw the way the governor explained, mm. tried to explain it yesterday, one yeah. of the questions that was asked, mm. and saying that the parallel market rate is not the official rate yeah. for, the, uh, uh, mm. uh, 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 for the market. But... In economics, I also know that there's what they call, of course, there's the market price determined mm. by demand and supply. Yeah. I don't know if that's what your people also call the effective yes. pricing yes. and all of that. Mm. So how do you take that into cognizance in the sense that when I go to the market, this is the price of this that I'm buying. This is the price of this paper. Yeah. And that is what I have to pay for it. Yeah. So when someone goes to the market now and exchange the Naira, the person is exchanging it at more than 379. Mm -hmm. So that was what the CBN governor was trying to explain yesterday. So yeah. just speak to me about that. First, let me take the pass through from inflation numbers to domestic prices. But what, what let me also start from this point. You see, the perception of exchange rate depreciation or exchange rate prices it's one in the economics that you talk about. It is supposed to exchange rate depreciation is supposed to stimulate export. That mm -hmm. is when the fundamentals are right. Like what China was doing. Yes, and is still doing. Mm -hmm. You know, and China is now looking inwards. I will, I will bring in a lot of the China example here. And so, if you depreciate your naira now, our naira, what are you stimulating? What exports? Oil or what agricultural production? Oil is not labor intensive. Agriculture is not up there. The other manufacturing activities is not up there. So the depreciation that you are, you are bringing in is to attract foreign investment to come in. And what our foreign investor com comes in? Portfolio. Portfolio is, is trading. You know, it comes in three months, the market is good, take the gain, go out, come back and watch again. And we don't need those kind of funds. And I've always emphasized this. If you're going to bring in your phone, invest in the economy, look at it over two, three years, employ people, build your businesses, then you will also be, you will be interested in the fundamentals of those economies. But you can't come because there is a boom now or because the rates are favorable for you. We want foreign investment. I'm not saying we don't want that foreign investment. You should want but both. Both yes. foreign direct investment of FPI. Uh, yes. So we, we should prefer work for FPI. Anybody, yeah. We prefer FPI FDI. than FDI. F FDI, sorry. Okay. FDI than FPIs. You know, because the distortionary effects of the FPIs, particularly for countries that have high volatility in terms of FX uh, dollar inflows, it is, it's a big issue. And that has also compounded, like I mentioned earlier, part of the factors that you know, drive the recession were also external, you know, external uh, global developments, aggregate demand, global aggregate demand in terms of the demand for our oil and the prices of even the oil, that is the main FX channel for the economy. But what the, the drive now is to stimulate other ch alternative channels of foreign exchange inflows, so that if it is generated domestically, particularly through export, and they're bringing in this inflows, then you'll be able to see a cushion for you know, meeting this excessive demand that we, we find in, in the system. And secondly, we also need to be looking inwards in terms of the policies that we do, in terms of the drivers of our growth, to shield ourselves from these exogenous uh, factors, all these distortions that come from this our open economic system. So if you are looking, the economies that are better coordinated internally, like the China, nature, nature did not China did not record a recession, even though they dipped significantly. Well, they still landed at 1.22% uh, GDP numbers. And China was growing for the last yeah, 40 years over 10%. 10%. Yeah, but the, you know, the, 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 the strategy was condemned globally, and their currency was perpetually... Uh, they, they say currency they, manipulation. Yes, but they use that to... Uh, there's nowhere you go in the world, in America, in the UK, all the chairs and things is, are all manufactured in China. But they've changed that perspective and they're also looking inwards now because they started seeing all this trade uh, crisis with other countries of the world. And so we, sh Nigeria too, should also start looking inward and raise that, you know, domestic or what they call national savings internally and face things that you don't need to import. We don't, we don't need to import, they produce them here. Impulse that are supposed to drive, we know that machineries and stuff, you need to import them, but most of the machineries now are even also produced locally. Including uh, this thing that used to, what do you call it, this uh, uh, 
called? Refinery, okay. modular, modular refineries refinery. and stuff like that. You have engineers here that are doing those things. Some of other SME activities, all those machines that you use and tools are all produced locally, including cars in Nigeria now. So if we are looking inwards, that this excessive demand for FX will reduce substantially. And the FX we have, or the one that central banks is holding, will just be to stabilize prices, not to meet every frivolous demand. Somebody wants to build a house, he wants to buy, he wants to import the doors, he wants to import where even the tiles on the ground, even the workers, he wants to go and import them to come and do the building for them. So those, we, we need to change that orientation and start you know, getting things done domestically so that when you need effect, it's for, it's for leisure, it's for people that want to go to holidays to, to Canada, Orlando, and, and start spending that. So we need to stimulate domestic output growth, including even uh, domestic capital. So from what even the CBN governor said yesterday, he's tried to send a signal, especially mm. to currency speculators, Yes. that our Naira, the official rate is not 480. It's not. It is done by currency speculators yes. for bribe and corruption, yeah. for bribery and corruption. Okay, let's take a look at, because we just have a few minutes to go, what kind of 2021 will we have? Mm. I know I asked you earlier when we re exit the recession, mm. but I want you to provide like a perspective for Nigerians, what kind of 2021 we will have, especially as the next MPC meeting comes up in, uh, in right. January. Having in mind mm. that Q4 numbers will come out, as, of course, before then. We don't know what they will be by the NBS. Having in mind that African Continental Free Trade Agreement will start off January 21. Having in mind also that COVID-19 vaccines may come. Uh, we don't know if our governments would ask for, like other governments are already doing. Mm. Having in mind that, are we going to see an opening of land borders, which was closed last August? So what kind of 2021 are we expecting for people that will want to go home for the holidays and say, what kind of Nigeria should I come back to? <laughs> well, in, 2021. in relative terms now, like looking at what we have now and what we are going to be expecting, we should see a brighter 2021 in terms of the GDP numbers posting positive, in terms of inflation numbers coming down, in terms of exchange rates reflecting market fundamentals and a loss table, in, uh, in terms of capital, foreign capital inflows, because the economic fundamentals are good for it now. In terms of pickup in the fixed income and money market, in terms of raising, you know, also investments, uh, capital in those, in those markets, particularly the fixed income and the capital market. We already see the bearishness picking up in the capital market as an alternative in window to the money market that is more or less in zero territory now. Treasury bills are way, way down there. So we, we expect all that reversal to come in by the first, second quarter of 2021. So the, the hope is there that 2021 will be a lot better than 2020 and things will pick up substantially. And this projection is by everybody, World Bank, IMF, WIO, uh, OECDs, even Nigerian staff estimate, MBS, Central Bank, and other, other analysts have projected those numbers. But that does not mean that we should not hold on very tightly to what we are doing that are bringing out these numbers and seek to getting these things more effectively implemented to impact the real you know, sectors of the economy and the life and livelihoods of, of Nigerians. So that, that's, that's, that's the hope and uh, we, we expect everybody, private, public, monetary, to play their role in this, including issues around securities and stuff like that to, to pick up. I like that mm. you brought in that issue of insecurity, I think, which is our biggest challenge right now yeah. uh, in the country. Mm. Farmers can go to the farms to harvest their products. They are, yeah. they are paying harvest fees. Yes. You can't travel right now. A colleague of mine was saying that they were almost, uh, they were almost attacked mm. on the way to Lagos or so. So, so many things to talk about. Thank you very much, Thank you very Dr. Much, Mahmoud, Nancy. for coming. Mm. All right, I'll be speaking with Dr. Hassan Mahmoud, the Director of Monetary Policy Department at the Central Bank of Nigeria. We've been looking at... Uh, the details in the communique, especially the questions and the answers yesterday. That's the much you can take on today's edition of the program. Continue online with us. Uh, keep commenting and sharing your views. I am Nancy Naji. Be the best you can be. I'll see you all tomorrow. God bless.